We're starting now. Cool. Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to VR 2022 and welcome to the technical session on emotion and cognition. As this is probably the first session you are attending in this year conference, I have some practical information about the structure of the session. We we'll have five paper presentations. They will be presented live by the authors, unless some technical issue forces us to play a backup video. The presentations will be done one after the other without time for questions in between. So how you can ask questions? The answer is Discord. We'll have a question and answer session of 15 minutes after the five presentations. So please post your questions for any of the others in the individual um, paper text chats in Discord, right? If you still don't have Discord open and ready, please see the link I just posted in the chat. There's a link there you can click. Okay, so let's start. The first paper will be presented by Maximilian Rettinger from the Technical University of Munich. So, okay, can you see my slide? Yes. Yep. yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so, hello everyone. My name is Maximilian Rettinger. I'm a PhD student at the Technical University of Munich. And I present you our paper titled, Do you notice me? How bystanders affect the cognitive load in virtual reality. So um, probably most of you already had the experience that when you put on a virtual reality HMD, such as an HTC Vive, Oculus Rift, PlayStation VR, or something else, you were no longer able to visually perceive the real environment. And therefore, it was not possible to see the people around you anymore. And that means that we are users don't know if they are standing in front of a person or where a person is at the moment. And likewise, it is more difficult to use um, for users to assess the weather and how many people are currently in the same room and what their feelings are. And these uh, uncertainties lead to higher resource consumption of the working memory, for example, due to social embarrassment, as shown in the picture, though it's a little bit scary, um, or in our thoughts of the viewer. And since there are already several popular application areas, such as VR training, in which the success of is affected by the cognitive load, among other factors, um, we investigated the impact of a bystander on the user's cognitive load. Therefore, we compared three different conditions in a between subject study um, the no bystander, invisible bystander, invisible bystander condition. In the visible bystander condition, there was an avatar integrated in the virtual scene. Um, which represented um, the bystander. And the cognitive load was measured with a mental rotation and a letter recall task. Um, and these task, tasks were completed in this virtual environment, as you can see here, um, while the participants were sitting on a physical chair, which the users could also see virtually at the same position. Um, the tasks were displayed on the screen and the subjects answered them verbally. And the procedure of these ta this task was as follows. First, um, the users had 15 seconds to memorize four letter pairs in the letter recall task. Then the participants were displayed five three-dimensional objects in two rows um, for 15 seconds. In the first row, a query reference object was displayed, and four objects are depicted in the second row, um, two of which match the reference object of the first row. And after that, the participants had 10 seconds to answer their matches. Um, then they had another 10 seconds to recall the letter pairs of the first task. And finally, there was a five second um, break since the sequence was repeated 15 times with different letters and figures. 
of which the first three sequences were practice tries, and the following 12 measured tries. And C sequences were um, identical for all conditions, so the um, visible, invisible, and no bystander condition. And the three different conditions, of which each subject completed only one, um, where it's called before the no bystander invisible and visible bystander condition, as you can see here in the table. And in the no bystander condition, the examiner left the room after the subject completed the three practice tries. So um, the exit from the room was sensed by the drawer and the sounds of the, of the footsteps outside the room. So for the participants. And in the invisible bystander condition, a bystander was physically involved by walking in the room, but not visualized in the um, subject we are set up or in, in the environment. And the visible bystander condition extended the last condition, so the invisible bystander condition, um, by visualizing the bystander um, and including his movements as an avatar in VR. And here you can see the riddle um, and the real environment of the visible bystander condition. The participants and the bystander's arm, finger, and head movements were virtually and physically at the same position, similar to the chair. And these movements were stabilized with an inverse kinematic technique and synchronized via LAN. Consequently, in the invisible bystander condition, no bystander was visible in the right image. And in the no bystander condition, no bystander was visible in both images. And to ensure that the bystander's movements did not differ between the invisible and visible bystander condition, they followed fixed routes on the spots A, B, and C, as you can see here in the picture. And yes, for the study, we uh, recruited 42 participants, which were equal, equally distributed to the three conditions um, regarding age, gender, and uh, level of education. And we analyzed the correctly remembered letter pairs of the three conditions with a Kreskovolis test, and subsequently applied the Dunn Bonferroni postdoc test. Um, here you can see the proportion of correctly remembered letter pairs with 95% um, confidence intervals. The differences were significant between the conditions no bystander and invisible bystander, as well as no bystander and visible bystander. So um, the no bystander condition had the best results regarding the letter recall task. And um, the results of the correctly solved mental rotation tasks indicated significant differences between the no bystander and visible bystander condition and the results between the invisible bystander and visible bystander group were also significant. And um, additionally, after completing the VR tasks, um, the participants um, rated the question, how well were you able to focus on the task by using a Likert scale um, from one, not at all, to seven, very well. Um, here's a no bystander condition, again, provided the best results. Between this and the visible bystander condition, the results were significant. And moreover, we analyzed results of the letter recall task and the mental rotation task by using the Spearman correlation. Um, its result provided a positive correlation between the test results. And furthermore, in the visible bystander condition, the eye movements of the subjects were captured. Um, with these, we observed a positive correlation between the duration of the user's eye movements to the bystander's avatar and the number of incorrect answers of the letter recall task. And all results indicate that the no bystander condition performs significantly higher than the invisible bystander condition and the visible bystander condition performs uh, the lowest. It has to be considered that the visual representation of the avatar could influence the results of the visible bystander condition, for example, by the shader, material, or geometry. 
And the study only investigates the influence of one bystander. So the results could differ if there would be more than one bystander. And finally, our study demonstrated that a bystander diminishes the user's ability to perform certain cognitive tasks. So the cognitive load is lower without a bystander than with an attending bystander. And the collected data prove that the integration of the bystander as an avatar mitigates the user's performance. And overall, these results indicate that the influence of the bystander must be considered in VR studies regarding cognitive performance and learning success in non-competitive VR trainings, since it is common for an examiner to be present to ensure that the participants that not inquire themselves or destroy the hardware to assist the participant or to detect certain abnormalities of the study. And yes, that was it by my side. And thanks for your attention. Thank you, Max. Let, let's move on. As I explained in the beginning, we you make all the presentations one after the other, right? So the next presenter is Andrea Valenti from Technico, the University of Lisbon. Um, okay, it, it's your turn, Andrea. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Andrei Valent. I'm from Institute Superior Technic from uh, University of Lisbon. And I'm going to be presenting our project called uh, Empathic Aurea, exploring the effects of an augmented reality queue for emotional sharing across three face-to-face -face tasks. So let's start with the main motivation of the project. Um, so we have the empathy effective communication hypothesis. And this hypothesis states that the more accurately a speaker can detect the emotional state of the listener, the more effectively can they transmit the message because they can adapt their speech and posture to the needs of their audience. On the other side, the better emotional understanding of the listener, uh, the better can they apprehend the message because they can understand the speaker's decisions and intentions. So we wanted to study this uh, correlation between communication effectiveness and emotional understanding. To do that, we design an emotional sharing system for users in the same physical space uh, in order to facilitate uh, emotional understanding. Our hypotheses were that the augmented representation of the emotional state of a partner is expected to increase emotional understanding, improve the transmitting of information, improve the apprehension of information, and increase interconnection. So in the beginning of our development, uh, we built our emotional emotion recognition model where we had 21 participants watch film clips from the film steam database while connected to ECG sensors. Then we use their uh, self-reported metrics to train to uh, neural networks that would output the two-dimensional point on uh, an arousal bivalence graph. Uh, then for, as a, in terms of a results, uh, for a four-class format, we achieved almost 71% of quadrant classification. Then we wanted to turn these points into a caller. So we validated a caller model with the same participants using the tertiary colors of the red, yellow, blue caller model. And we use the coding of brightness for emotional uh, intensity, as we can see on the well-known uh, Pluchik's wheel of emotion. In terms of the AR system, we wanted to create, uh, to create a, a ripple effect to be placed around the, the face of the partner, uh, which created this sort of uh, aura that was updated every two seconds with new uh, ECG data. In this project, we have two named constructs to identify the agents involved. So we have the encoder, which is the agent that is connected to the ECG sensors. And then we have the decoder, uh, the agent that is reading the emotional cue and is equipped with uh, the headset. The user study to evaluate the ORIA had 12 participants divided by six pairs, uh, three of which were uh, friends or acquaintances, and the other three were complete strangers. Um, the evaluation of the system was done through three different tasks. In the first task, we asked the encoder to watch a film clip and then to report their emotional uh, reaction in the valence and arousal scale. 
The other participant had to watch uh, their partner while they watched the clip and then report with the same scales what they thought was the emotional reaction of the partner. The decoders would, were then asked uh, the percentage of the system they felt they used for their answer in opposition to the other communication cues. What we found was that the trials that uh, relied more heavily on our system achieved significant, significant uh, higher accuracy results. And this validated our first uh, hypothesis of increased emotional understanding. Then we had our second task where we gave a pattern block set to the encoder and a pattern image to the decoder. We asked the encoder to assemble the pattern image using only the instructions uh, given by their partner. Uh, each decoder had a trial with the system and a trial without the system. What we found was that the performance actually saw an increase with the system and this, this um, change in performance might be attributed uh, to some changes in instructional style by the decoder and it validates our second hypothesis of improved uh, information transmission. We also found that encoders reported a higher level of worry with the system, which is related to uh, feelings of self-consciousness. And this worry was even higher if the, the participants were paired with people they didn't know before the, the experiment. In terms of interpersonal connection, decoders reported a higher increase in interpersonal connection, while uh, encoders reported a decrease. And this might be related to the fact that by equipping one of the participants with a headset, we eliminated uh, some uh, communication cues that are, that are very important for empathic exchanges, like facial expression and uh, eye gaze, for example. Um, so we uh, rejected our fourth hypothesis of increased interconnection. Then on our third and last task, uh, we asked the encoder to watch a video and then to retell the events of the video uh, to their partner with as much detail as possible. Then their partner had to retell the events again using only uh, the information that was given to them by the, the encoder. Each video had around 60 key ideas, which could be transmitted between participants. What we wanted to know is if this uh, higher emotional understanding would lead to better information apprehension, and it did not. Uh, the performance with the system was significantly uh, lower, and this might be related to the testimonies that said that the ripple effect was uh, more destructive than it was helpful. And for that reason, we also rejected our third hypothesis of improved uh, information apprehension. In terms of limitations of our work, uh, the, the main one is the small sample size, uh, because a, a, a larger sample size would increase the reliability of the self-reported metrics of emotion, the, the arousal and valence scales. And another important limitation is uh, the lack of analysis of the emotional contagion phenomenon, which is a um, common consequence of the, of the cognitive empathy. In terms of future directions, uh, we want to explore this validated emotional sharing system uh, as a way to facilitate social interactions uh, between people uh, that have conditions that in impair uh, cognitive empathy, like uh, autistic people. Um, another a uh, future direction will be um, the classroom setting where we introduce students as multiple encoders. And uh, it will be very interesting to understand the, the design implications of an augmented space of such dimensions. I hope you get a chance to read our paper and our more detailed discussion. And if you have any questions, feel free uh, to ask me. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Excellent writing time. So this was um, a conference paper. The previous one was also a conference paper. And the next one is the third conference paper in this session. Um, so the next presenter is Caroline Heischherzer from Lucerne University of Applied Sciences and Arts. I hand over to Caroline. Don't forget to ask your questions on the Discord channel. All right. Thank you very much for the introduction. 
So I'm Carolyn, and today I'm going to talk about um, our user study on how virtual reality could support um, jury understanding of expert evidence in a virtual environment. So this project is part of a series of experiments assessing how virtual reality could support the jury during a courtroom trial. And members of a jury are responsible for weighing case evidence, determining culpability, and are expected to render verdicts that are informed by complex case evidence. And this makes their task even more demanding. And we wondered if the unique characteristics of AR that allow the user to perceive space and depth could also facilitate the understanding of forensic evidence that is spatial in nature. So in Australia, an expert can be retained during a trial to provide an expert opinion on an aspect of the case. And these expert witnesses are specialists in their subjects and may provide a statement based on their knowledge and qualification. And these are generally a combination of facts and opinion. Uh, they convey specialized expertise that is unfamiliar to jurors and where the court cannot rely on general knowledge and common sense. But these have a significant impact on the jury and they play a highly influential element in the decision-making process. So however, it has been argued for the past few decades that expert statements are difficult to comprehend and evaluate for jurors due to the expertise involved that remains largely outside of common knowledge. And this happens despite the jury's best, eff best efforts to reflect on information carefully and to thoroughly review what was presented to them. So and this could potentially compromise justice. Suggested improvements to better support understanding and improve the presentation of such evidence is an increased use of visual aids. And visual aids are suggested to be effective at engaging a more effortful consideration of evidence. And it has also been suggested that jury communication needs to be adapted to better accommodate contemporary jurors by incorporating technology-based presentations. So we applied virtual reality as a visual presentation method to explore whether this technology could improve comprehension of an example of complex evidence. So in this research, we are interested in knowing how VR could serve as a visual aid for presenting expert evidence to jurors who are tasked with understanding information unfamiliar to them. So we asked two primary questions. First, can VR improve lay people's comprehension and recall of a case by facilitating the application of the main knowledge of an expert witness? And second, can VR improve lay people's comprehension in general the main knowledge of an expert statement? So the first question looks at details pertaining to a specific case, such as memorizing key elements that were brought up during the statement, or how well information can be inferred that was not explicitly brought up. And the second question investigates the general knowledge the participant may have on the topic of the expert. This tests their current knowledge of before listening to the expert and how it may have improved after listening to the statement. And to answer these research questions, we run a user study examining the usefulness of VR for presenting expert statements. So the underlying context of this user study is that of an expert witness taking a stand and explaining the evidence to the jury. And for this experiment, it was adapted as a situation where participants passively listen to the expert while they're being guided through the explanation of the evidence. And the expert topic presented in this paper is bloodstain pattern analysis, or in short BP. BPA looks at the shape, size, and how bloodstains are distributed in order to determine what activities may have actually caused the bloodshed. This can give an interpretation of the events of a crime, such as whether the victim was sitting or laying on the ground at the time of impact. And this is done by calculating the blood trajectories, which are here shown in blue and pink. So participants listen to the expert witness testimony about BPA and an assault case where the victim was struck several times. The expert statement and the scenario were developed with the help of forensic scientists at the Institute of Environmental Science and Research in Auckland. And to answer the aforementioned research questions are between subjects that the design was set up with each participant experiencing one of two possible display methods. The first one was a guided experience in VR, and the second was a video shown on a 2D screen. This one we also refer to as baseline. And these showed a room with a simple layout and two bloodstain patterns. 
The scene was arranged and captured at the facilities of the Forensic Institute in Auckland and can be seen on the images. The statement was recorded by a professional voice actor. And we measured how well participants remembered key points of the statement, the ability to correctly infer and apply information from the statement, such as the position of the victim, how well the knowledge of BPA increased, and lastly, cognitive demand. And to guide the, VR, the participants' attention in VR, we added three types of visual cues. First, arrows would indicate the participant when to turn, whereas highlighted areas showed specific regions of interest. And yellow outlines showed the participant which object the expert was describing at that point in time. Now the baseline condition showed a video consisting of images on a screen, whereas the VR condition allowed free exploration and the participant was guided by the previously described visual cues. It's sometimes possible to estimate the area of origin from which blood was dispersed to create an impact pattern. The area of origin of the first impact pattern was approximately 0.8 metres from the floor, approximately 0.2 metres from the left wall, and approximately 2.15 metres from the back wall. So we had three primary takeaways from this experiment. Now, VR participants scored significantly higher in the spatial reasoning and recall questions, showing a better understanding of dimensions and layout of the room, but they equally improved the general domain knowledge. Now, a surprising finding was that participants carefully observed the environment, but remained mostly stationary and did not explore the scene as much as we expected. Participant feedback suggests that moving in VR and listening to the statement may be too mentally demanding and therefore decided to focus on the task instead. And, but despite the impression that the task was mentally taxing, we saw no differences in cognitive demand between conditions. So we conclude that a combined approach may provide the best of both worlds, but participants can still benefit from the spatial information in VR without feeling overwhelmed. Thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to your questions and comments very shortly. Thank you very much, Caroline. Uh, it was very nice. We still have two papers to go, so before the questions. So don't forget to post your questions on the Discord channel. And the next paper is uh, an invited journal paper, as most of you know some papers in VR that are published in, in regular journal issues of the TVCG are invited to VR, and this one is one of them. So uh, it will be presented by John Quarles from University of Texas at San Antonio. It's with you now, John. Okay. All right, so this is called, this paper is about uh, doing a visibility simulation in a, in a wheelchair uh, and trying to look at, uh, in, in VR, and trying to look at what does, it, how does that affect people's implicit bias towards uh, persons with disabilities? And this was part of my, uh, Dr. Uh, Tanvir Chattery's dissertation a couple of years ago. Uh, so the motivation of this is, well, we're really trying to educate people about multiple sclerosis uh, to promote empathy. Um, this project actually kind of was inspired by uh, how the MS walk works. So you get a, a whole bunch of people that are uh, either have MS or are caretakers of or are friends of people who have MS or just people who care about MS. And they get together and they, they walk uh, to, to raise funding. Um, and they kind of have a similar uh, motivation that they're trying to educate people about multiple sclerosis to promote empathy too. So we thought, well, how can we do that with VR? Um, but really what we're looking at here is implicit attitude. So implicit attitude are really kind of evaluations of really anything. In this case, it's uh, evaluations of, you know, your, your uh, tendency to be, to prefer uh, people with disabilities, for example. Right. Uh, this can be these can be attitudes that you may not even be aware of that you have, or they may maybe be attitudes that uh, you people just don't want to you know, embarrass about, or people don't want to let on. There's actually been quite a bit of 
a previous work in this area in VR uh, with respect to racial bias, uh, but we were looking specifically at uh, uh, bias towards people with disabilities. Uh, the environment that we used again was actually a a replica. It was a virtual version of the uh, AT and T Center, and the task was really to navigate the AT and T Center as you would at a uh, an MS walk, and you run into various people along the road, and they tell you about various facts about MS. Um, you will either use a the the participants either use a wheelchair interface, or they use an in-place walk interface, which I'll explain a bit. So the wheelchair interface was, it was a real wheel, it was just instrumented a, a, a real wheelchair, uh, but you interacted with it in a pretty similar way that you would interact with a real wheelchair. There's more, uh, there's more information on the paper as to exactly how we did that. The walk-in-place interface was, uh, you had to lift your legs alter alternately to make the uh, avatar walk forward and uh, to turn you would just turn you know as you would in real life uh, now to look at implicit attitudes we use something called the implicit association test uh, like I said you can you there are implicit association tests for I mean you can make one pretty much on anything uh, this is one that was specifically developed not by us but by Harvard I believe that was uh, for dis uh, for investigating preferences towards people with disabilities compared to preferences towards people uh, without disabilities. And what we were specifically looking at here is kind of your change in IAT score. So we had a post IAT and we had a pre IAT. And um, the thing to remember about this is uh, in this case, a more negative number is implies a larger change towards preferring persons with disabilities, okay? Um, so yeah, we really just wanted to figure out what, what is the effect that the interface, uh, that is in place walking or wheelchair interface, and what is the effect of narrator? And when I'm talking about narrator, uh, there, there's, this is really getting into the two independent variables that were, uh, uh, that, that, that were in the study. One, you have a navigation interface, a wheelchair in place walk. Uh, the other one was the, the narrator, the narrator that you, the narrators that you encountered along the path, uh, some of them were in wheelchairs, uh, for uh, some of the participants, and then for other participants, then they were not in wheelchairs. So again, this is a between subjects design. Uh, so this was all from a first person view. So if you were in a wheelchair, it appeared that you were in a wheelchair and you could see yourself moving in the wheelchair. Uh, and the uh, same effect as if you're walking, you see yourself look down and see yourself walking. Uh, and we're using full body tracking in both of these situations. Uh, the narrators, like I said, were either in a wheelchair or they were standing, okay? So the hypotheses here were, we were really, there's two hypotheses here that we're talking about um, today. One was, well, if people are, if the participants are uh, going through this in a simulated wheelchair, in a wheelchair, um, we would expect that they would have a larger, say, re uh, a larger tendency towards preferring uh, people with, uh, with disabilities, they would tend towards, you know, preferring people, a larger change towards preferring people with disabilities. And the same is uh, the other, a very similar hypothesis, but specifically to the narrators, if you have a narrator that has a disability, then we would expect that, um, or narrators that had disabilities, we would expect that you would have a, uh, a higher change in your uh, implicit attitudes towards people with disabilities and you prefer people with disabilities more than you did before. Um, there were 40 participants in this. Um, like I said, there were four conditions. Uh, there's the first one there is wheelchair and narrator without disabilities, then wheelchair and narrator with disabilities, uh, then in place walk narr narrator without disabilities and in place walk narrator with disabilities. And like I said, pretty much how this worked uh, was we would, you know, we would give them an IAT test before the experience. They would go through this experience where they'd interact with uh, a whole bunch of different narrators. And then they we would give them a second IAT test. Uh, in terms of the results, uh, we found that for the wheelchair 
a narrator with disabilities condition was significantly different than both of the in-place walking conditions. And oh, just, just to say that our alpha here was really, we were really setting our alpha here to be, we did quite a bit of, uh, we used Bonferroni corrections. So this is at a point zero zero eight alpha, I think. So I'm only reporting on those results. Um, so yeah, there was a difference there. And we could see here that the, for people that were in the wheelchair with a uh, non, uh, uh, an area without disabilities, they had a significantly larger uh, preference, change in their preference towards people with disabilities. Um, we also looked specifically at the in-place walk uh, narrator without disabilities and the in-place walk narrator uh, with disabilities. And we found a significant difference there too. And uh, as we expected, the in-place walk narrator without disabilities uh, resulted in a, a larger change towards preferring people with disabilities. Um, so why did the wheelchair have an effect here, for example? Why did the wheelchair basically reduce implicit bias? Uh, we ended up accepting this hypothesis. I think the, the thought was that this was similar to a protective, uh, perspective-taking self uh, kind of interaction where you know, you're putting yourself in the shoes of other people. Um, for hypothesis two, uh, why did the narrators without disabilities seem to work better? Our narrators with disabilities seem to work better. Uh, we're looking at this as maybe this is something related to the, the contact hypothesis uh, theory, which is basically saying if you have more interaction with someone with disabilities, then you're likely to prefer them more, have you know, be, be less negatively biased towards them. Um, so that's pretty much everything. Uh, there's a lot more in the paper that you can read. Uh, if you are interested in VR cyber sickness and our accessibility, check out the inclusive VR session on Wednesday. Uh, we have a couple more papers in there. It should be interesting. Okay, thanks. Thank you, John. Nice presentation. Let's now move for the final paper of this session. That's a journal paper. And uh, the presenter of this paper is Michael Sola from George Mason University. Michael, are you there? Go ahead. Okay, okay, I'm sorry for the late start. So, okay. Um, hello, my name is uh, Michael Sola. I'll be presenting mood-driven colorization of virtual indoor scenes. Um, this work was done by me and fellow researchers in different universities. And so virtual reality enables a highly immersive experience for digital storytelling, movies, and gaming applications. Uh, but one problem for artists and designers is making sure that a particular mood is experienced by users who view their scenes. Um, for this reason, uh, we have proposed a system for automatically changing the textures and colors for objects within a virtual indoor scene so that the combined effect matches a specific mode. Okay, so what problems are we trying to tackle with our approach? Virtual scene creation can be time consuming and also challenging and automation can also weaken a designer's freedom. So in this project, we seek an approach allowing designers to exploit automation while not significantly altering their creative visions. How do we achieve this? Well, in the following figure, we can see an overview of the approach given a virtual indoor scene and a mood where optimization process produces an output that matches the input mood. Specifically, we focus on five selected moods, cheerful, melancholy, peaceful, romantic, and scary. The user first selects a mood and a virtual room as input. Then the optimization process takes place with objects in the scenes being selected and their textures altered. Uh, the number of objects selected to be altered depends on the current cost in the current step of our optimization process, and we use uh, simulated annealing in this process. So our cost formulation is as follows, where CM is a mood cost and CR is a realness cost. WM and WR are the selected weights for each cost depending on the preferences of the user. So the user can decide to either produce realistic results or results based on the mood that they want to optimize for. And we also define the mood cost as follows, where N refers to the number of pictures used, uh, CI in the range zero to one is the cost of an image I of the scene. And we define the cost of an image I 
as follows, where MO is the cost of the desired mood and MK encodes the cost of the moods that are different from the desired mood. A WO and WK are the weights of the moods accordingly. So users can also select uh, the weights they want for, for their optimization. They can do combinations. And then for realism cost, we implemented the color comparison method based on the CIEDE 2000 algorithm, uh, since it provides a distance metric that accounts for human perceptibility of color differences. We define the realness cost as follows. We can see right here, where W phi is the weight and C phi is the realness cost of the object phi in the object set capital phi of the scene. The weight W phi of the object phi can be seen as well. You see, you can see it right here, where uh, phi superscript A is a surface area and phi superscript alpha is the importance of, of the particular object. And that importance weight is also set by the user depending on what objects they want to be more prominent in the scene. Uh, we get these results by comparing to common real life colors objects determined by the open surfaces data set. For more details on our formulation, please refer to our paper. For the optimization process, we use MCM seek technique specifically simu simulated annealing with a Metropolis Hastings state searching step. Uh, we start with the scene with no colors assigned and we select a number of objects on the current, uh, uh, we select a current number of objects in the scene to alter the textures colors. Uh, using a, a total of 25,000 images, we trained a deep learning classifier for the corresponding moods. In particular, each mood relates to 5,000 images and all images are from real world indoor scenes. And we based our CNN on the VGGF model to classify images of the scenes. Uh, we then use a camera. In this case, we did it in Unity to take images of the scenes. In most cases, that's four uh, images uh, since most uh, rooms have four walls. And so we try to capture most of the scene and we produce our mood cost this way. Our approach modifies the input scene by optimizing it with respect to the total cost function, C total. Uh, to act effectively sample solutions from the search space, we define a Boltzmann-like objective function as follows, uh, where we accept the current state of the iteration with the following probability, where phi naught is the configuration of the current step and phi is the last accepted configuration. In other words, uh, the current state and the previous accepted uh, state that we had in a room. Here we can see a little demo of approach in action, and here we can see some results. So. Here, I'll read uh, what these results are. We have a cheerful dining room, a melancholic living room, scary bedroom, romantic living room, and a peaceful bathroom. And in this case, we uh, created this uh, results with a mood weight of 0 0.7 and a realness weight of 0 0.3. So we try to reach a balance between uh, the results for mood and the results for, for, for something realistic. Uh, here we have some more results. Here we can see two results. Uh, with the realness uh, weight set to one. So we're trying to optimize it so the results are more realistic. And then here we have uh, mood results for one scene. So we conducted four user studies. In, uh, in this case, for user study one, we asked users to rate our results based on if they match the mood optimized for. We also asked users to match mood uh, to an optimized scene. Users also rated two scenes based on how realistic they found them using a five point Likert scale. Uh, for user study two, we conducted an Amazon MTurk study, and we asked users to compare our results to those results uh, created by artists. So it's a blind test. They don't know which were results from our optimization, which were uh, done by 3D artists. And they had to ask which were, they had to select which were more convincing. For user study three, it was uh, more straightforward. We just compared uh, uh, results seen through a desktop app and through a virtual reality application just to see which was more immersive. And for user study four, uh, we asked users to evaluate how likely they thought that the color schemes experienced in our scenes matched in real indoor environments. And in this case, scenes were optimized for with three weights, uh, one for mood weight and zero for realness. In other words, just for mood cost, zero for mood weight and one for realness. In other words, realistic results. And then for 0 0.7 and 0 0.3, which we found to be, uh, so 0 0.7 for mood and 0 0.3 for, for realness cost, which we found uh, in our studies to be uh, to create effective results. So let's talk about some of the results. The average for user study one, the average rating to the synthesized results was 3.9 out of five. 
for the voting tasks, users voted for the result optimized for in all cases, except the scene optimized uh, for Scary. And we contribute this to uh, there being some semantic similarity between uh, melancholy and scary moods. In other words, users voted more for uh, melancholy than for scary. And so we attribute the result uh, to that. For user study two, uh, we hope that our synthesized results would uh, be up to par with, uh, with the results created by 3D artists. So we hope to see something uh, similar in terms of, of users voting for our results or for the ones designed by artists. And we found that in all, in 11 out of 20 comparisons, our results received more uh, match results of artists or were, there was a difference of only one vote. So they were pretty much on par in that case. And for user study three, unsurprisingly, the virtual reality uh, uh, application performed better using a five point Likert scale. Our results in virtual reality scored 4.17 compared to 2.81 using a desktop application. And then for user study four, we found that users voted the results to match real world examples in 10 out of 14 scenes. So in most scenes and uh, the only cases where they voted uh, for, uh, they, the, the, the users stated that our results didn't match what they would expect were the moods optimized, I mean, were the scenes optimized only for mood. So uh, based on these results, we, we can see that having both uh, our mood cost and the realness cost produces the, the most effective results. Okay, so to summarize quickly, uh, we propose a novel approach for automatically changing textures to match a certain mood. Uh, we've also produced a mood classifier and we additionally provide, provide a more thorough statistical analysis of our, our user studies, which you can see in our paper. And with that, uh, that is the presentation. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Michael. And uh, with this presentation, we ended our series of five paper presentations. I thank all the authors for their excellent work. And now I also thank the audience. We had over 90 people at the same time in, in the room. It's a pretty good audience. And now we have questions. So if you still have any questions, especially for this last paper, please post them in a Discord um, channel. So I didn't introduce myself in the beginning. I'm Anderson, and I'm the chair of this section. And now I will try to conduct some Q&A with the authors. I think it's it makes sense that we start with the questions for the first paper of the session. And then we move on, right? If we have new questions coming up, we can go up and down. Let's start. So with uh, the first presentation was uh, Maximilian. And uh, we have a question from Michael Bonfert. Great study, thank you. Very relevant for user research. Then two questions. How much of the group differences can be contributed to the distraction from the bystanders? To open the microphone. Um, yes. Yes. So, um, how much were the bystanders news? Um, yes. Say, um, the bystanders knew that there, um, or the participants knew that there was a bystander by um, the um, practice tries. The practice tries were identical to the measured tries. So, um, they, they also saw the bystander as an avatar, or they heard him walking around. There was just a difference in with the um, invisible, no, with the no bystander condition, because um, there the bystander was in the room for checking if the participant has some problems. And you get um, the complement of the question: Were the bystander known to the participant, and were they? Actively distracting or possibly present? Um, yes, yes. Um, they, um, 
they, the bystander was uh, passive, passively active. Um, so that means that he was just uh, walking in the room between the three, three spots and um, he just um, was looking at his hands because of the finger tracking, so maybe, or um, moved really naturally. So um, not mm -hmm. to distract the participant more than it has to be. So that it okay. is really natural and the mm -hmm. results are, or the distraction is really low. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so another question from uh, Andrea Bonch. Uh, nice talk, Maximilian. Sorry if I miss it. What exactly was the bystander doing? Okay, I think you already answered a little bit, right? The um, bystander was okay. walking from. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Was he she distracting the participant or were he she just static? So the same type of question if you want to compliment or about the behavior of the, um, the bystander right so i think you can if you think you can say anything else about it um yes um i saw something about the examiner that uh, um, the participants knew that it is an examiner and so that means that uh, um results should be much stronger in reconditions when the participants know that it is not an examiner which is who takes care about the participant um i think that's a great okay. question mm -hmm. and then the other question i think you already answered but uh, bruce thomas asked where are there any other audio cues from bystanders than footsteps you're talking or Manipulating objects or anything? No, there, there were the, so for the, um, the, the bystander um, or the participants could only hear the and see the bystander. Um, they heard only the footsteps and in the um, no bystander condition, the, the door closing and the person walking away. So they, mm -hmm. they, that they felt really alone. Uh, okay, we still have a question. Uh, let's do it, even if we go a little bit over with the time. But I have Kyle Johnson, and uh, he's quoting the question. I don't know but I'd like to add a comment to Michael's question. That, that was the, the first question I asked. Um, that I think an experimenter has a very different impact in that they may be calming to a, a VR user, knowing that someone is watching out for them. This is very different from someone being in the room or worse, entering the room that uh, may be disrupting. Yes, so, yes, that's a good question. Yeah, I, um, the, I answered before because I was... Yeah, I see. Yeah, <laughs> okay, so yeah, the experimenter, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the role of the experimenter yeah. impact, so yeah. they try. Okay. So let's see if I had one question that's worth asking for you. Mm. Yeah, I, I, when I, I saw this uh, work, I, I thought that maybe the, the bystander is a breach in immersion. Because if, if uh, uh, the user is immersed in VR, they should not be listening or hear anything, any noise, or perceive the bystander by any chance. What do you think? Um, yes, it's... Um, I mean, if you work very well in the immersion, even yes. if the ex experimenter is in the room, it should not be perceived, right? Yes, yes, it, it depends on the immersion, um, how... It's a way of how to mitigate are... this, perhaps. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Um, I'll, I'll move on for uh, next. Is, so I have questions to Andrea. Um, from Nadeline. Superb, relevant research and nice presentation. Did you also gather some qualitative feedback or comments about the system? Uh yeah, for sure. Uh, on uh, on a discussion, it's a lot focused on uh, on the feedback, but I think the 
the main takeaway, or I think the most important takeaway, would be that uh, the the part the participants that uh, were accessing a stranger's emotional states uh, trusted the system way less than the participants that were um, that were paired with friends or acquaintances, and that's because. If you are paired with a with a friend, you can uh, validate the system much faster because you can correlate the emotional cues that you already know with the with the state of the of the system. And uh, I think it's important to understand how we can find a better design to improve that part. Mm -hmm. And also, the the people that were paired with the, with strangers were the only ones that felt that felt that the system was invasive. So if they were uh, sharing the, the emotional state with the, people they know they were actually excited about it. I think those are the main takeaways from, from the feedback. And uh, the complement of the question is, what was the subjective user experience of Aurea? I mean, In terms uh, of- you collected any subjective user experience? Yeah, uh, we, we did. And a lot about uh, how, how accurate they felt the system was and the results were, better than expected actually and um and also this part of the distraction a lot of the most of the users felt like the the ripple effect was really distractive especially on a task where you're trying to memorize information so yeah yeah i, I have one question on that uh let's see what I the question is um if you could clarify why you decided to use uh, an aura instead of words like happy, sad, to communicate emotional status. Yeah, so uh, it, the, main, the main objective was to use this aura not just as uh, information, but also as a way to uh, improve effective empathy. So we wanted to use color and movement uh, because they work better as emotional stimuli than... than uh, words and i i think using words would actually uh, increase the the cognitive load probably on the experience uh, and it was already <laughs> too high for for one of the tasks so i think it actually yeah. wouldn't wouldn't help yeah mm -hmm. okay i have mark billingers that say nice talk and then uh, we'll be using more sensors in the future to measure emotions such as eeg for example not yes absolutely future experiments yeah, I think the future, not just emotional recognition, but to understand the impact of the design in terms of focus and all that, I think EEG is absolutely the, the, the right direction and for, this, mm -hmm. for this project, yeah. Great. I have a comment from Bruce Thomas, very nice visuals. Thank and, you. Uh, <laughs> um, I also have one other comment for myself that uh, you must learn to read emotional status along the whole process of evolution and um, now as you see on, from your results perhaps these amplification system that you're using it's a, some sort of amplification system uh, mm -hmm. it helps with performance in some some tasks so do you think that perhaps creating synthetic emotional statuses that potentialize performance could be better than reading physiological data uh in synthetic as in like a wizard of oz situation or uh... yeah, depending on if i know that uh when the the person i'm talking to perceives me as more happy they will perform better then why mm -hmm. not just communicating to them that i'm happy yeah even if i'm not that would be a Something. good strategy, but I think this this project works as a, comp a complement to the communication cues. So there were parts of the experiment where the participants felt like what they were seeing on the aura wasn't uh, aligned with the communication cues, like the the shoulder placement and the mm. the the lips and all that. So I think <laughs> that probably wouldn't wouldn't work as well. I think. <laughs> yeah, my my. my... The co my other comment is, uh, do you think the decoders relied on only on the aura or they could combine face expression and body language all together? Yeah, I think they combined in, in your, uh, in the objectives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I you think. didn't try any, any, any condition without the, the face expressions. 
Yeah, that's that was a that would be interesting to see without any communication cues. But I think if if you just gave them uh, the emotional state with without any communication cues, I think they would just have to trust it, right? Uh, yeah. There wouldn't be any validation of the system. It would be uh, an interesting mm -hmm. experiment, also. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's it. Nice work. Let's move on. But so. The next one is for Caroline. Um, so from Andrea Bunch, thanks for an interesting talk. How experienced have the participants been with VR and how much time to familiarize themselves with the headset and the IVE has there been? Um, so the the participants, the majority of them had some experience with the VR headsets and only a few, like one or two had excessive use um, experience with VR and there are one or two who had no experience at all. The majority have used it at least at some point. And in terms of familiarizing them, so they there was a training session with um, the VR headset. So they were put on the VR headset and there was a room the exact same size as the room they are going to view. And they had to walk um, along the wall. So they had a good feel for the size of the room and how much they could uh, explore within the room because we, as it's happened in a previous experiment where I didn't do that, that they were scared of running into walls. <laughs> so we did like a, so this is a space, this is a safe space. You can explore as much as you want. And um, so they yeah. were, the, the option was there. And um, I, I see the other question, if there was a body yeah, avatar. Yeah, the other question, <laughs> if, if there was a body avatar. So there was not a body avatar. Um, it, I assumed at the time that because they are mostly observing that it would not influence them, but that's possible that it did. But what the, the participants commented on in terms of feeling overwhelmed was that it was a lot of information to take in. So they had this 3D environment that they were um, viewing. And at the same time, they had all the cues and they had a statement. So they they were worried of missing out on something because they were focused on one thing and then it moved to the next um, element that they were missing out on something because they're trying to understand that. So they said they wished they had like the option to, to pause for a moment or to wind back. But anecdotally, so unfortunately I, that's not, we didn't measure, but anecdotally what was a good um, impact was those who only viewed it on the screen and then afterwards I offered them, so would you also have a look at, would, would you like to look at it in VR? And almost everyone said yes. And then what we were initially hoping in the VR condition that people would actually walk around and expect the scene, which didn't happen, happened to those who viewed it initially on the screen. And then though they had like a baseline of information and then they were able to build a foundation within the VR environment of like, oh, this is what happened here. And what are these? So they started being a lot more inquisitive about the environment and had a lot more questions um, that they would then have liked to ask the ex expert. So that's also why they, one of the, the conclusions was that perhaps a mixed approach might might be the, the better one. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, and uh, then I have my observation on this that, uh, how do you think your results would change if a directed passive immersive video was used instead because your users could walk freely and there was some audio playing and they should follow mm -hmm. the and try to look to what was being presented but they have to act and if you just play a passive immersive video then you can have both you have well i don't know <laughs> whether there are comments about it when you say an immersive like a 2d video in in, in yeah. vr yeah the problem is that if immersive if, is if you can look wherever you want to look and uh i was talking more uh, i was thinking more of a 3d video just playing and you have, it's directed <laughs> you have to look where the camera is pointing to but it's yeah, so different we were... than just showing static static image exactly so the idea why they were allowed to look around was because in previous studies they were able to build a better mental map of the room to so understand the layout better. Uh, if, if you are just have a fixed perspective, then this is 
that's um, more difficult to build this mental map. So this is why they were given the option to look around, um, explore freely, because this allows them to build a better layout and better understand where things are. And this actually worked. So um, the spatial dimensions, they were able to estimate uh, the, the distances very well. They remembered very well what things were, the entire layout of the room, which was not the case for people who only viewed it in 2D on a screen. Hmm. That, that's why we added the visual cues. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, I have a question from Amela. Have you investigated a bias that a visual enactment of the probable course of events may unintentionally produce? So the bias question is a really interesting one. It, it does come up every um, very often. Mm -hmm. So I did. Mm -hmm. So I did not look into bias specifically. Um, so bias in general, how good does a, a crime scene um, affect a person? There's been many questions on um, even without the enactment, just being in a, on a, in a crime scene as a, as a lay person, that you might want, um, depending on how intense it is that it, you might have strong reactions that you want to punish someone so that you might be more punitive uh, um, as a result so i didn't look into that yet so that would be like a second the next step so essentially the first idea was established to the fact sbr have a positive influence if you would see a scene in 3d or evidence in 3d and as a second step if there is a, a potential bias and in terms of visual enactment, there is a bit of a, I think, a bit of a split, a split in the forensic community, uh, what they believe is better, because unless you have CCTV, there, is, there are assumptions when you enact um, what might have happened. And assumptions also mean uncertainty, which is why um, in these initial steps of the, the research they've done, we decided to stick to what is already there and this is what we can establish um, with certainty. So, so I think the defense would also use the same environment to try to show something. And uh, so a, a last question quickly uh, from Zoe Platyong. How the participants in a jury would be viewing this in VR, for example, in a real world jury context, jurors often view evidence collectively. Would the VR experience facilitate collective review or would this be expected to be one of one on one, for example? Yeah. So uh, oh. the way so the way we initially thought of it is that every juror essentially gets their own headset and as things are being presented, they can view their own their own version. There are many possible scenarios uh, because there is something like a jury viewing in, in Australia. So where the jury goes to the scene of the crime and views it collectively that there is like a collaborative um, version where you can see other participants. Mm -hmm. So we didn't quite go there yet and decided yeah, to sure. look in the individual juror. And um, I know in Switzerland, they have used VR in the courtroom just once in the past years, but it has happened. And then it was streamed. So there are people who are using the VR headset, but the, they, it was streamed to a TV. So everyone could witness what's happening. Um, everyone, so the, 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 the judge and the lawyers, everyone could, could witness mm -hmm. what's happening. Okay, thank you very much. I think you verified everything. Let's move on for, uh, I think I'll ask to John right now. Yes, John, I have a question from Kyle Johnson. Can you comment on the SSQ scores? Yeah. Um, so we really didn't find very much with the SSQ stuff. In fact, I don't even think it made it into the final version of this paper, but I can tell you what we had in there originally. <laughs> um, the, mm -hmm. yeah, we, there was like very little significant differences that we found with uh, anything. The only thing that we found, uh, there was a small difference between the wheelchair with, this honestly we couldn't explain, okay? So I'll tell you, but I don't know how to explain it. We found a difference between the, the wheelchair uh, with people without disabilities, the narrators without disabilities, and the wheelchair for the narrator with disabilities. I don't know why. <laughs> that was the mm -hmm. only significant difference that we found in there. Like everything else, it was all, uh, I mean, the, the, we didn't really see much of anything out. There wasn't even any really before and after kind of significant differences that were going on there with the SSQ. So 
Uh, okay. I uh, there's a compliment. Uh, the compliment for the question is also how long was the experience and how much rotation your pitch if ramps were used? Did you right, have... right, right. Yeah. Uh, so the experience I want to say was about 15, 15, 20 minutes, but it was, there were very little, uh, say, head rotation that was actually going on. And people could look around and they looked at their avatar some of the time, but most of the time you were sitting, you know, or standing. Uh, looking straight forward there were a few curves on the course but they were pretty gradual because was, i mean the 18th concern is actually really big and the whole uh the the whole path was around the whole thing so uh i think that was probably part of it it was not a task that really had a whole lot of head especially mm -hmm. you know a yaw rotation that was going on uh okay. yeah that, that probably Thanks. contributed to why we didn't see a whole lot of simulator sickness Right. And then for Riku Otono, thank you for the great talk. I'd like to know about the wheelchair in PR. Where their participants give negative for the experience riding wheelchair in VR, like cyber sickness? Well, I think the question is similar. And um, you already answered most of it. The, the wheelchair was stationary, right? Right, right, right. So the wheelchair was stationary. We uh, we were really just tracking the wheel rotation uh, with some excel with uh, I think we just strapped phones to the wheelchair wheels and then you could sure. do it that way. But uh, yeah, no, we didn't yeah. really get we didn't really see a whole lot of uh, we didn't really get a whole lot of complaints about it. I mean, if okay. anything, I will say one thing. If anything, the wheelchair was we did have a bike trainer that was connect to the back mm -hmm. of it, which give you like a little bit of like resistance, but not. It, I would say it did not have a feeling as though you were in, like you were having to push a real wheelchair. I mean, mm -hmm. likewise, if you're doing in-place walking, it's not real. No. <laughs> it's not exactly real walking. So, sure. nah, you know, we're doing the best we can, mm -hmm. uh, but we really need right. like actual haptics, you know, actual haptics to make it really work like a real wheelchair. Sure. Yeah. I have one question. Uh, do you know similar experience made in the physical world that corroborate your results? Um, you know, the, a lot of the things that we, if you, if you look in the discussion part of the paper, there's, there's a, I think we, we cited a few studies that, um, to kind of explain why our results ended up the way that they did. Uh, there's a fair amount of literature on, on, uh, uh, perspective taking. So that's kind of like, I mean, a lot of most perspective taking literature, I want to say is there's actually some of it in VR too, but most of it is, you're kind of imagining, you know, you're putting your putting yourself in somebody else's shoes. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's some literature there, and in the uh, there's also a fair amount of literature on the contact theory idea, where if you, which makes sense, right? If you have more interactions with people with disabilities, sure. you'll feel more comfortable around them, and then you know, likely that would reduce your implicit bias as well. I, Sure. I, I think that there has been studies. I'd have to go back and look in the paper for the specific. Mm -hmm. uh, but there and is a fair amount think, of discussion in there about that. Yeah. But then in, in this context, do you think uh, presence, embodiment, embodiment or other VR feature is key or a simple technology could do the job, such as seeing a video? Um, well, there's actually a fair amount of work we did. Um, so that it is key. Uh, at least from a presence perspective, we found it to be key. Mm -hmm. um, we did actually measure embodiment in this paper. We didn't find anything really specific, except that there was an interaction uh, around the, the embodiment score and the type of narrator that you ended up having. There was an interaction there, but we didn't see any like main effects there. Uh, mm -hmm. For presence, we pretty much saw the same kind of ideas that we saw of presence uh, in previous studies and around similar kind of things where um, we ran a study a while back where we looked at, uh, we compared immersive wheelchair interface to uh, immersive, just like game controller interface to game controller desktop interface to, uh, I think there's another one. Anyways, the point is that, yeah, the, Presence does seem to make a, a difference. One of the one of the the uh, metrics that we use here 
is a is a questionnaire that we've developed in house and used for a number of studies uh, called the multiple we call it the multiple sclerosis questionnaire. Okay, and mm -hmm. and just basically it's a it's a very a high level test of like, well, did you, can you recall anything of what the, the narrators were talking about? And in previous studies, and I, uh, this was really part of the, the, the point of some of the previous studies that we've done. And yeah, presence, we did find a people that experienced more in the, in the, in the conditions where they, ex, that they had more presence. Yes, they ended up learning or recalling information more effectively. Why is that? Well, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why that could be, but that's more research that we can do. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Sure. Let's move, move on to the questions about the last paper for Michael. So I have a question from Rizal Mahmoud. Why four different user studies? Was it possible to complete the work within one user study? Were the participants the same for your user studies? Okay. Yeah. Good question. So, really, what that boils down to is the length of our of our experiments. This uh, project really took a uh, course over about two years, and yeah, it would have uh, it would have been better to to do fewer user studies. Uh, but since we had the data, we we decided to just uh, do it all. Um, but yeah, especially I think uh, of all the user studies, the last one we did where we were uh, asking users to compare the results, uh, well, if they were convincing, and also if they match real world. Uh, 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 if they match real world expectations, uh, I think uh, maybe we could have just stuck with that one. Um, but uh, it's it's additional data in the end. Okay. And I have a question from Nadine. What specific design recommendations would you give fellow VR designers about how to design a mood inducing the? Okay, that's a good question. So I'm uh, I'm definitely not a designer by trade. Uh, but what we uh, what we found, I mean, uh, with with our with our Wait, results. Wait, I have one recommendation you could give for them to learn something else because you are automatizing the design, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> the system chooses the colors. Yeah, the no, designer and, uh, doesn't need to, to choose the color anymore. And yeah, our system definitely still needs fine tuning. If we want to. Uh, Eventually, the next step would be to to uh, produce even more realistic results, uh, especially in our early user studies. Uh, people would comment that maybe they weren't as realistic as they'd like to be. In our next iterations, uh, they like them more. Um, but yeah, definitely at this point, uh, the biggest thing we see with this project is sort of a starting point. So uh, the big thing uh, when when you want to use automation is sure it can give you a, a rough draft of something, but it doesn't always work out to to what the artist wants. Uh, so it'll be a little different. So our hope is, uh, at least for now, this can be something like, okay, we have an initial result uh, that's close enough. And then maybe that's a point where a designer has to do less work to get exactly what they want. And uh, there's uh, other applications as well. Mm -hmm. So Nadine has a couple of questions that are, I think they go together. Have you thought about empowering the participants to create their own mood VEs? And what differences would you expect in this, that scenario? And we assume that others would be able to correctly identify that mood. Yeah, yeah, no, that's uh, that's a great point. Uh, so we chose uh, the five moods we we selected specifically for simplicity. So we also included some semantic similarity. For example, we had scary and melancholy. Uh, so I think uh, stereotypically, maybe they'd expect like darker colors. So we wanted to check if there is difference there. Also, for example, romantic and cheerful. Uh, so we wanted to see if maybe they could tell the difference between those uh, moods as well. Uh, yeah, no, I, it's definitely uh, an area that, that we should explore more. And uh, really, it comes down to time. So uh, for each uh, for each mood, we needed a, a data set of 5,000 images. So having the user uh, get all that data, it, it would uh, be a lot of work on the user's end. But it, finding effective ways to do that would uh, definitely be worth looking into. Okay, now just to finish, I have one question. Uh, you have shown a very successful technique in statistical terms. I mean, you could show that uh, combined the results work for most people. But did you have the opportunity to see how specific groups of individual references or feelings may diverge from the mainstream perception? 
Yes. No. Yes. That's a, a very if good you take question. Take a, a set of engineers, for example. Yes. <laughs> or yes, no, an individual person. That's definitely, uh, I'd say, uh, one of the biggest weaknesses for now. Uh, so we, we didn't really conduct. Uh, I mean, uh, besides the basic, uh, uh, the typical information one usually gets from users in a user study, we didn't uh, too strictly look into that difference. But it's definitely uh, worth evaluating. Uh, we found, uh, based on our related uh, related research, there are uh, generalities that are shared between color perception and emotion. But there's definitely uh, cultural and uh, group uh, specific uh, meanings that can change. So uh, uh, what we've done here is, is, is of course, only look at, at uh, mostly university uh, students and, and, and professors. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there were most of the most of the participants in, a, in our user study. Uh, so uh, we definitely could 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 expand in that regard. But also we. Uh, uh, at the same we time, find we had, in your data uh, some outlier. We oh yeah, specific outliers that disagree with everything. Oh yeah, no, I mean, there's uh, uh, we had participants that said that this doesn't match at all. No, 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 no. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, there are definitely participants who didn't find anything convincing, and there are others who, who did. So it's True. it's uh, uh, great. It'd be Thank you very much. To fine tune that a little bit more. Yeah. So to conclude this session, I thank again all the presenters. Congratulations for your great jobs, great works, great research. And uh, thank you all participants. We still have 43 people in the room, even if it's already past midnight in this part of the world here. Um, so I think you can close the session and enjoy the rest of the conference. We'll meet around. Bye bye. Thanks for organizing. Bye, everybody. Bye. bye. Thank you so much. And congrats to everyone. Bye bye. I think I have to close the session. <laughs>